Well, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Axel Threlfall, Editor-at-Large at Reuters. Delighted to welcome you all to this first event in the, the second series of our legal debate program. Um, you don't get a second series unless the first one goes very well, so I think we got something right there. Um, and series one set the bar, um, I think, quite high. Um, we tackled some, some great topics, including the right to be forgotten, during which, I don't know if some of you were there, a feisty Jeffrey Robertson QC came close to carrying out a citizen's arrest of Sir David uh, Omand, uh, who he called a serial lawbreaker. We debated the pros and cons uh, of a corporate death penalty, uh, the EHCR uh, and democracy, something no doubt we'll touch on uh, tonight, and uh, uberification of, well, pretty, pretty much everything. Um, as I said, tonight we asked, do our laws keep London safe from terror? We've gone with the Debate format, as I always say, it injects a little bit of uh, uh, friction or competition into the evening. Um, you've voted, and we'll take a look at that in a second, uh, and then we'll hear our debaters, and then you will vote again. Um, my job is, is very much to keep the debaters on time, not to inject my opinion. But let me say just a few very, very brief words. Um, tonight's subject is, of course, one we're forced increasingly uh, to consider. Uh, indeed, for those residing in the UK, um, our nation's security outside versus inside Europe has, of course, become the subject of heated debate. Um, Paris, uh, Istanbul, the Russian jet over Sinai, uh, San Bernardino in California, few can deny that things are indeed getting worse. Few can deny uh, our enemies have uh, new resolve and new uh, capabilities. Few can deny the need for effective counterterrorism measures to protect us all. Uh, indeed, since 2000, there have been some five major pieces of terrorism legislation in the UK. Uh, some presented, and I think this is important, as temporary or emergency, but which significantly have remained part of UK law. Not surprisingly, then, the, the more legislation introduced, the more the debate has turned to the tension between uh, anti-terror laws and human rights. The desire to protect uh, and be protected, uh, but at what cost? This, of course, uh, I, I think will, will be a, um, an important part of tonight's uh, discussion. Two obvious battlegrounds there in the legislative response to terror, the Investigatory Powers Bill, uh, and the privacy issues that raises, um, and the Human Rights Act, which the Tories have, have of course, pledged uh, to replace. Um, how far should we go in sacrificing and constraining a right to privacy uh, to make our city safer? How ready should we be to abandon our values in the name of national security? Do we do, do we need to do uh, whatever it takes, or have we gone far enough? We will hear from our panelists in just a second. Before we do that, let's take a look at the pre-debate uh, voting. Right, so yes, our laws do keep London safe from terror. You're on 37%. Uh, the no's are on 29 and the undecideds, 33%. It's always good, actually, when the undecideds are high because it means um, we've got a lot to play for and uh, the job is, uh, is, is down to this lot here. Um, let's get started. We're going to do four, a 2 for 2 against, as always. They'll alternate opening statements before we open it up to some Q&A and some closing uh, uh, statements, and then your ch chance to vote again. Uh, Adam Wagner is up, up first, or Wagner. 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 A barrister at One Crown Office Row, well known for his human rights advocacy work. He founded both the acclaimed UK human rights blog and rights info, and in 2015 was shortlisted for Human Rights Lawyer of the Year at the Liberty Awards. I'll introduce them each as they come up. Uh, Adam, you've got eight to ten uninterrupted minutes uh, starting right now. It's a funny position because I feel like I can only do worse than the, uh, than the vote you've already taken. So thank you for that vote of confidence um, before we started. I, I wanted to start with a bit of personal history, uh, which is I became a lawyer because of the events of the 11th of September 2001. And I was in a, an unusual place on that day. I was in Cuba on the east, towards the eastern side of the island, about three miles away from an American military base called Guantanamo Bay which at the time was essentially a tourist attraction where you could go and see the only McDonald's in Cuba, and we were about to go and see the only McDonald's in Cuba when September the 11th happened. So it was very interesting for, to see, just as I was preparing for this debate this afternoon, that um, President Barack Obama has announced how he is going to finally close it after 15 years 
of it being open and eight years of him trying to do so. And he said this, the detention facility does not advance our national security, it undermines it. Keeping this facility open is contrary to our values. It undermines our standing in the world. It's viewed as a stain on our broader record of upholding the higher standards of the rule of law. This issue is complicated, and I want to try and bring out some of the complication. The question before us, do our laws keep London safe from terror? Well, the, the obvious answer in one sense is no. Our laws in and of themselves do not keep London safe from terror, not on their own. Our police keep, the, keep London safe from terror. Our security services keep London safe from terror. Our democracy keeps London safe from terror. Our democracy keeps us safe by making sure that people who do not like the way the country is being run have a way of changing that, changing that government without resorting to violence. That's what democracy is. Terrorism has existed for a long time, in fact, probably as long as democracy has. And terrorist causes have changed, in fact, methods have changed. But one of the things that, that terrorists have always had in common is that they hate democracy. They want to either overthrow democratic governments or get what they want by bypassing democracy. In another sense, it is our laws in themselves that stop terrorism. It's the rule of law. The rule of law is the cornerstone of our democracy. It's the invisible thread that runs through a successful democratic society. It means that people who make the laws are also subject to the laws. The rule of law keeps us safe. Let's take an example, the law of murder. Now, the law of murder at, on the, at the most simple level is, is important because it stops murders happening. And if they do happen, it allows us to punish murderers and take them off the street. But the laws surrounding murder have a wider aspect. The law of murder may be complicated, but in broad terms, a person on the street in the UK knows what to do or not to do in order to, be, to avoid being convicted of murder so he can regulate his conduct. But the law does more. It tells the police what they should do, when they should investigate a crime, and who they can arrest for that crime. It also tells the police what they can and cannot do in the course of an investigation. The law tells the Crown Prosecution Service when they can bring a charge against a person for murder, and how to bring that charge. It goes further, it tells the judge and the jury when they can convict a person for murder. It tells the judge how long they can send that person to prison for. It tells the Secretary of State how to detain that person and how long for and in what conditions. The law isn't just about catching criminals, it's also about how we catch them. And that is the rule of law. And sometimes it's not just about how the police and the security service protect us. Sometimes it's about how we are protected from the police and the security services. Because as we in Europe know too well, there are other kinds of terror aside from bombs on buses. The terror of the jackboot, the terror of the anonymous click on the telephone, the terror of the knock on the door in the middle of the night. And our laws protect us against those terrors too. So against that background, I'll come to the heart of this debate, what's often described as liberty versus security. Benjamin Franklin famously said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. From the other perspective, Boris Johnson said last month, the security services should be able to monitor the emails and phone calls of anyone who poses a threat to Britain. As he, as he said, he's not particularly bothered with this civil liberties stuff. Either way, liberty and security are set up as if in opposition to each other. And either way, I reject that distinction and I, and I suggest that we all should reject that distinction. Because in democracy, there is only liberty. In a democracy, liberty includes security. 
all human rights systems worth their salt include the right to security of, per, of, of the person, and that is central. So, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights, the first four rights, the most important four rights, are the right to life, the right not to be tortured, the right not to be enslaved, and the right not to be arbitrarily detained. They are the, they are the rights in the Convention which are absolute. They cannot, they do not have a balancing, another side to balance them against. You cannot breach them under any circumstances. Against that background, do our laws keep London safe from terror? I say yes, they do. Because our laws, made by our democ democratically elected leaders, who are also subject to them, are the fundamental DNA of our democracy. They define the boundaries of our liberty, and our liberty is precious and fragile. It's easily chipped away at, and if you chip away at liberty, you're on the path either to anarchy or dictatorship, and history tells, has taught us that lesson, or not taught us that, that lesson, over and over again. So any analysis must start from that premise. If you start from security versus liberty, then security always seems to win out. Our laws keep us safe. I, I'm not going to argue that every anti-terrorism law in the past 15 years or the past 50 years has been perfectly calibrated. How could I possibly argue that? But what I do argue is that in the 15 years since 9-11, we've done a pretty good job at balancing our rights and keeping ourselves safe. So here is a, there are seven, in my mind, fundamental questions the courts have addressed in the past 15 years in relation to terrorism and security. I probably missed out five, um, but there are seven. One, should we detain terrorist suspects without charge? Two, if not, can we subject them to some kind of home curfew, a, a control order? Three, can we stop and search people without any reasonable suspicion? Four, should we be able to detain dirt journalists if we suspect that they're holding terrorist materials? You've got eight minutes, by the way. Okay. Good. Five, should we allow blanket surveillance of our private communications? Six, should we be allowed to kettle protesters? Seven, should the police be able to keep our DNA if we're innocent forever? And I argue that none of those questions has an easy answer, and that's why we rightly so argue vociferously about each and every one in Parliament, in the public sphere, and in the courts. And the answers to those questions have been a mixed bag. Sometimes the court has sided with the Home Secretary or the security services. Sometimes the courts have sided with the people who are bringing claims. But in all of those issues, freedom is more than physical security. A free society treats suspects fairly. A free society respects the presumption of innocence. A free society constrains its police and security services. I do not criticize the Home Secretary or the, or the uh, just, uh, Secretary of State for Justice for demanding more powers to protect citizens. That is their job. But it doesn't mean they're always right. Those cons these, the constraints ebb and flow as the threat changes. I'll finish with, I started with Barack Obama. Um, I'll end with Aharon Barak, who is the former Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court. He said, sometimes a democracy must fight with one hand tied behind its back. Nonetheless, it has the upper hand. Preserving the rule of law and recognition of individual liberties constitute an important component of its understanding of security. At the end of the day, they strengthen its spirit and strength and allow it to overcome its difficult difficulties. So have our laws kept us safe from terror? I say they have, and I commend the motion. Thank you very much, Adam. You, you, you went longer than uh, Jeffrey Robertson, by the way. And that's, uh, more <laughs> right. Arguing uh, against uh, Laudian Blair, former commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, 
Uh, Lord Blair was instrumental, of course, in the transformation uh, of the Met's uh, organisational structure. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I'm going to advise you, uh, ask you to vote no. Uh, and just to um, put ourselves in context, while Adam was in Cuba, I was in the government's control centre, Cobra, uh, watching the Twin Towers coming down. Um, the motion is about laws. Do laws keep us safe? So in the fine tradition of debating, I'm going to start with something else. I am in a state of shock. I need to make some declarations. A great number of my friends are women. I've met and have huge respect and affection for many Muslims. The relatively few Mexicans with whom I have come into contact, you can see where this is going, did not seem to be homicidal or sexual predators. And I suspect that the Pope has a fair working knowledge of Christianity. <laughs> uh, but yet I agree with something that the Donald uh, said last week. When Donald J. Crump, Trump says that... <laughs> says that Apple should assist the FBI to break into the telephone of Syed Rizwan Farouk, who with his wife killed 14 people and injured 22 others in a terrorist-inspired attack in San Bernardino. He is, and I find this very difficult to say, he is right. And Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, is wrong to refuse to do so. I simply don't believe that opening one telephone in Apple's laboratories will open up all mobile devices in the world to the threat of insecurity. I wonder if you, as an audience, might agree with the supposition I've seen expressed that this might be a commercial rather than an ethical uh, uh, decision. But where Cook is, however, right and relevant to this evening is to point out that the legislation which the FBI has had to use is more than 200 years old and needs updating precisely. That is exactly what we're debating tonight. We need to update the laws. Our laws against those who murder, who plant bombs, who fire guns is fine. It's the law against those who are fosterers and quartermasters of terror which need an updating. And the principle of those is one called the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act or RIPA 2000. I'm going to base what I'm going to argue this evening on my own experience as a police officer and contrasting most of that experience with what was happening at the end of my time, 2005 to 8, and what's happening now. I was involved in combating the provisional IRA, PIRA, for almost 30 years. My first point this evening about that is that they killed more than 1,000 people during their campaign, a lot of it in this city, but it represented only a fraction of the threat that Islamic extremist terrorism po poses to London now, together with the rest of the United Kingdom. Let me explain the differences. Pyra members did not want to die, with very few exceptions. They usually avoided mass casualties. They had a negotiating position. They gave warnings. They were fighting their way to the negotiating table, not blowing it up. ISIS and Al-Qaeda are the mirror image of that position, seeking limitless atrocity and death without any plausible endgame. They have a millenarian ambition for darkness, as we see in Syria and we saw in Paris. The second point about Pyra, for the purposes of this evening, is that no one has ever expressed better the dilemma faced by liberal democracies in combating terrorism than Pyra did after their failed attempt to kill the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, in Brighton in 1984. I should add, they missed her, but they killed and maimed others. Their anonymous spokesman declared afterwards, I quote, you have to be lucky all the time. We only have to be lucky once. Absolutely right. So how much chance do you want to give their successors? Thirdly, ISIS and AQ were born and have matured in the digital age, which is why those proposing the motion are simply wrong. In this globally connected digital age, laws have to be constantly updated, which is a a a Apple has inadvertently been arguing. The Investigatory Powers Bill, which is a bill that's coming, the Snoopers Charter, as people have described it, is two things. It is a necessary updating of RIPA, the one I mentioned before, a bill drafted at the end of the last century when few of us who were adults at the time had ever sent an email, let alone searched anything online. So far, so good. Let me give you a single example. In 2008, hardly any mainstream service providers offered encryption. Now, 
Companies as large as Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, Twitter, and Google provide it all the time automatically, which is a fact that most customers are blissfully unaware of. Our security services need legislation to enable them to break the encryption that happens every time you press a Google button. But more controversially, the new bill is an attempt to adapt to the corollary of that, the soon-to-be-complete disappearance of technologies which have been fundamental to the detection of crime for 40 years, namely the tracing of telephone contacts. It is through this that almost all major crime and terrorism cases have been solved over the last 40 years, from the 21st July bombings in 2005 to the pensioner burglars of Hatton Garden. Yet, and this is no secret, that technology is being replaced by internet-based systems which are increasingly untraceable under current legislation. This is voice over the internet protocol or VoIP used by Skype, WhatsApp, Facebook, and a host of other openly available systems. That is not traceable under current legislation. Beyond them lies Tor and the dark net. Build in whatever safeguards you deem necessary, but don't vote against change. The internet is a wonder, but like so many inventions, it brings challenges as well as advantages. Crime and terror flourish within it. Burglar Bill used to break into your house and steal your telly, hopefully leaving his fingerprints behind. Internet Irene doesn't need to because she breaks into your bank account. Smutty Simon used to try and take pictures in public changing rooms and then gloated over them in a dark room. Pedophile Peter shares his pictures of children being sexually abused across the world. And for the purposes of this evening, Pyra Patrick worked with a tight group of fellow terrorists in the back streets of Londonderry, but Jihadi John uses the internet to send messages to the world while his companions send orders to the disaffected and the disturbed in Belgium and in San Bernardino. So the current laws are simply not keeping us safe. They are not capable of keeping us safe. They have to be amended. Let me now turn to one other issue the community element of the government counter-terrorism strategy known as PREVENT and the laws that underpin it. I think Diane and I might have some points of agreement here. The UK government strategy for countering terrorism has four components. Three are pretty obvious. Uh, these are protect, national infrastructure in crowded places, prepare, coordinating responses and multidisciplinary training, pursue those responsible for attacks and attempted attacks. The fourth is PREVENT. And there's been a lot of press about prevent, which comprises the efforts to strengthen communities against violent extremism. This is a bit trickier, ladies and gentlemen, not because most people don't want to prevent outrages, but because they can be very concerned about what may be involved in doing so. For prevent to be effective, it means self-policing with a small p by the communities most likely to be affected, which in this area means the Muslim communities. It means in workplaces and homes, and very tricky indeed, in places of worship and places of education, helping people to challenge belief systems that support faith-based violence, or rather violence based on extreme versions of faith. It means asking parents to report that their children might want to travel to Syria. It means asking academics to declare limits to free speech, mosque leaders to identify members of the congregation, or even fellow preachers as being inclined towards violence. You've got about a minute left. Excellent. I've got about a page left. Once again, I turn to the need to change the legal structures behind the as this aspect of our safety. The wrong people have been given responsibility for reasons that are now out of date for leading this extremely complex and sensitive drive for safety. Who are they? They're the police. That's right. The same people who stop and search who in extremists and with great courage will come through the doors in balaclavas, uh, armed with firearms, who will arrest, detain, and ultimately shoot. However good our police may or may not be, being in charge of prevent, as well as being in charge of investigation of terrorism, uh, asks too much of them, and it asks too much of communities to believe that the police can do so better than other authorities. Other elements in civic society are leaving the lead to the police, and worse than the police, to the Home Office. Those charged with education, with local government, with culture should be leading this. Once again, the law needs to be changed. I come to my conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, 
we live in a very dangerous world. Only the truly complacent or the unrealistically idealistic would believe that our current laws do not need constant updating. The investigatory power bills needs to happen. As they stand, our current laws are not keeping London safe, and I urge you to vote against the motion. Thank you very much, Ian. Arguing for the motion uh, that our laws do keep London safe, Diane Abbott, MP Hackney and Stoke Newington, and a Shadow Secretary of State for International Development. As an activist, and I think I'm right in saying this, I hope I'm right in saying this, uh, you yourself have, have been a target of domestic surveillance, Diane. Um, your eight to ten minutes starts now. Um, it is with um, the utmost humility that I follow these very distinguished gentlemen in this debate. But let me begin by saying that there is a tendency, and I've seen it over 28 years in Westminster, that if you oppose ever more draconian anti-terror legislation, you are accused of being soft on terror. But let me just say that I heard the 1996 Canary Wharf bomb here in Canary Wharf. I heard it from my kitchen in Hackney. I'll never forget how frightened I was. And of course, there was 7-7. My son went to City of London. He had to pass very close to one of the explosion sites on his way to school. And the hours that I had to wait to hear whether he was safe was some of the most terrifying hours of my life. Even more recently, I have a Nigerian friend, a journalist. She was in Nigeria. She was captured by terrorists. She was beaten. She was held to ransom. These are not... Um, things I have read about in the paper, these are things I have personal knowledge of. And so I want to begin by saying that as a mother, as a Londoner, as a politician, and also as a global citizen, I resist any idea that I am soft on the terror. But I'm arguing this evening that in as much as laws can keep us safe from terror, our laws are. But the burden of my remarks is that laws alone cannot possibly keep us safe from terror. And reliance on laws alone and ever tougher laws is actually a snare and a delusion which can distract us at looking at the root causes of the international terrorism and the international jihadism, which is a threat to us here in London and a threat across the world. And furthermore, I would argue that not only are ever more draconian laws not the answer, they would, in fact, be wholly, wholly counterproductive. Let me begin by talking about the nature of terror in the 21st century. There's no excuse um, for terrorism, but modern terrorism has certain distinct characteristics which make it less amenable to the criminal justice system than at any time in recent centuries. In the 19th and 20th century, the state relied heavily on informers to infiltrate terror networks and keep us safe. This was because terrorists had to physically meet to plan and conspire. In the 21st century, terrorists organize on the internet. They can get all the instruction information they need online. And the idea that more draconian laws and more stringent penalties can alter that is completely wrong-headed. The other crucial difference in relation to international jihadist terrorists is that they are prepared to die. This was never the case in the past. And this presents an almost insuperable obstacle to an exclusively criminal justice approach to dealing with terror. If would-be terrorists are prepared to commit suicide in the course of their terrorist activity, it makes it very difficult to guard against them and means that no penalty will make any difference to their willingness to carry out their attacks. The other thing we've seen in recent years is the rise of terrorism as propaganda. It's always been an element of propaganda in any terrorist act. But the propaganda value of terrorism has reached new heights in the area of the internet and YouTube. ISIS, with its YouTube videos of beheadings and its so-called um, Islamic State, is beyond the reach of the UK criminal justice system and could care less what penalties we would impose. And finally, one of the emerging narratives 
of the so-called Islamic State and Middle Eastern terrorists generally is the Crusader narrative. And the Crusader narrative says that the West is the enemy and the opponent of all Muslims. And the more draconian the legal regime we impose, the more we feed this narrative. Draconian, draconian, state, dra draconian state attacks on civil liberties, which inevitably would be seen to particularly target Muslims, are actually a recruiting sergeant for terrorism. I took part in the debate on 90 days detention without trial in 2005, and I also took part in the later one on 42 days. And the thing, and we defeated the government, my own government, in fact, we defeated them twice on this issue. And the thing that struck me about the debate was the impressive speeches which were made, not by civil libertarians or former human rights lawyers. They were Tory MPs who were for, former army officers who'd served in Northern Ireland. And one by one, they got up and stressed that draconian detention measures in Northern Ireland had indeed been a recruiting sergeant for terrorism and importantly, bound the wider law-abiding Catholic community even closer to the terrorists. In fact, some former of army officers who were MPs at that time argued that whenever you detained large numbers of people without trial in Belfast, you would always see a spike in activity elsewhere in the city. So, bring my remarks to a close, of course we live in a dangerous world. And it's, I think, unfair to accuse anyone of complacency. I've explained my own personal experiences, both as a mother, as a friend, and as a politician, with the consequences of terrorism. But what I know, as a professional politician, and this will come as a shock to Sue and Blair, I'm sure, that politicians all too often use anti-terrorist legislation to make a political point, not because they will think it will have any practical merit. We know, history teaches us, with the greatest respect to Sir Ian Blair, the policemen always want more powers. But what we have to ask ourselves about draconian legislation, infringements on civil liberty, infringements on privacy, is will they actually make us safe or will they feed the narrative in which terrorism flourishes? We need, if we as a society, want to push back against terrorism, not just here in London, but all over the world. We have to understand the political context. The political context is not an excuse, but it is a context. We need to look at the marginalisation of communities in our great cities, which make them a happy hunting ground for people that seek to recruit terrorists. Look at Paris and the Bonalo, and all of those terrorists in Paris came from those excluded Muslim communities. So we have to look at the context. We have to look at excluded communities. And we have to remember, above all, that not only will increasingly draconian, anti-civil libertarian, anti-privacy legislation not work, but it is counter to everything we are fighting terrorism in the name of. So I ask you to support this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Diane. Um, finally, uh, arguing alongside uh, Ian is Jonathan Swift QC with uh, 11KBW. Um, someone experienced across the whole range of, of public law areas, including human rights, including data protection, and uh, freedom of information and regulatory law. Uh, Jonathan, you've got eight to ten minutes. Thank you. Um, so, our laws keep London safe from terror, is the motion. I don't think I'm going to need eight to ten minutes for this. Now, when you walked in, on that screen, you may have noticed was a big zeppelin with the word terror written on it. Now, if that's what terror looked like, I think it would be possible, logically, to argue in favour of the motion. But I believe it is impossible for any reasonable or rational person to believe uh, that the motion can be answered yes. And I think I say that without fear of offending anybody else on the panel this evening. Because if you've listened to what each of them has said, not just Ian, but also Adam and Diane, none has sought to argue otherwise. The true position is that no laws could keep London safe from terror. 
Um, it's notable that the only way in which those who are trying to persuade you to vote yes have tried to persuade that is by, by saying, by accepting, that the laws do not keep us safe from terror. Adam said so, I think, almost in terms at the outset of what he said. He supported the laws we have, not because they made us safe, but because they did not, and because they represented a higher objective, a, a rule of law and a liberal democracy. Um, he developed the idea, the notion of a balance between liberty and security, and rightly extolled the virtues of a free society. So I say again, the proposition in this motion is one that it is simply impossible to accept. Risk, including the risk from terrorism, that bad or mad people will commit or try to commit unspeakable crimes, is the price we pay, and it is the price we have to pay for living in a relatively free liberal society, a society that is free from blanket surveillance, a society in which the majority of powers available to our police to question and to search are exercisable only on the basis of consent or the basis of reasonable suspicion, a society in which the police and the security services are not permitted simply to come up to us and say, papers please, and demand that on the spot we prove who we are and what we are doing to their satisfaction. Uh, and let me also be clear, um, just because it's topical, um, the answer to the question posed in this debate, the adequacy of our laws to keep us safe from terror, does not depend either on the European Union, it doesn't depend on the Convention of Human Rights. Regardless of whether we stay in the EU or whether we leave the EU, the risk of bad people doing bad things or trying to do them remains the same. The answer to the question posed by this debate remains the same. The problem is not the EU. And in any event, the premise, it would have seen, for many of those who argue that uh, the United Kingdom should leave the EU, is the fact that outside the EU, the United Kingdom will be just as open to trade, just as open to free movement, just as open to all the other aspects of personal freedom which permit terrorists the opportunity to do their work. Nor is the problem here the Convention on Human Rights or the way in which judges in this country interpret the scope and application of those rights. Reasonable, decent people, and in this room we are all reasonable, decent people, would not challenge the basic rights to integrity of the person, to integrity of the home, in each case subject to derogation to the extent that is permitted by a fair balance between the rights of the individual and the general interests of society. Reasonable and decent people accept that such a balance must be struck. And the consequence of this is that to contend that, that um, the laws we have are laws that keep us safe is to overestimate what a law can do. And also, it is to underestimate what terrorism is. The Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has said on several occasions um, that terrorism is the antithesis of liberal democracy, the liberal democracy that the convention rights seek to maintain. So the freedoms that we have, the freedoms that we rightly want to preserve, um, provide the spaces in which it is possible for men and women who are committed to terrorist causes to evangelise, to raise funds, to equip themselves and to plan. And this, I think, is the centre of the conundrum. Our laws rest on the premise of liberal democracy. The very legality of those laws rests on whether they are compatible with liberal democratic principles. Yet, as a necessary consequence of this, the laws we have are not the best that we could have to keep us safe from terror. Uh, the best, the most effective laws, so far as concerns their deterrent effect, um, and falling from this, their, ambil their ability to impede uh, the practice of terrorism, would be laws, for example, powers of search or powers of seizure or questioning that were intrusive and were also exercisable randomly and unpredictably. Now, this is a point well made um, in a judgment of the Supreme Court at the end of last year, a case of Robertson Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Now, what Lady Hale and Lord Reed, neither of them well-known advocates of the totalitarian state, said was this. Um, any random, suspicionless power of stop and search carries with it the risk that it will be used in an arbitrary or discriminatory manner in individual cases. There are, however, great benefits to the public in such a power. It is the randomness and therefore the unpredictability of the search which has the deterrent effect. 
and also increases the chance that weapons will be detected. The purpose of this is to reduce the risk of serious violence where knives and other offensive weapons are used, especially that associated with gangs and large crowds. It must be borne in mind, they said, um, that many of these gangs are largely composed of young people from black and minority ethnic groups. While there is a concern that members of these groups should not be disproportionately targeted, it is members of these groups who will benefit most from the reduction in violence, serious injury and death that may result from the use of such powers. Put bluntly, it is mostly young black lives that will be saved if there is less gang violence in London and some other cities. But so far as the legality of such a power, a suspicionless power, uh, referring to the Court of Human Rights Judgment, a case called Gillen, um, they, both of them went on to say this. Um, they said the court in Gillen took a rather different view. The authorization there could be given for reasons of expediency. Above all, the court was concerned at the breadth of the discretion given to the individual police officer, the lack of any need to show reasonable suspicion. Um, uh, or even subjectively to subject to, to suspect anything about the person stopped and searched, the risks of discriminatory use and of misuse against demonstrators and protesters in breach of their convention rights. So, but quite apart from this, and in any event, those sorts of powers, powers exercisable without the need for reasonable suspicion, are necessarily very, very rare in English law. Um, this is not a recent consequence of the Human Rights Act. The common law has always set its face against such powers. That goes back as far as Entink and Carrington in the mid-18th century. Um, in the judgment in Roberts, coming right up to date, the Supreme Court accepted the legality of a so-called suspicionless power to search. But in truth, the power they were considering wasn't a suspicionless power at all. The power only arose if it had been authorised by a senior officer, if its use had been authorised, and the senior officer could only exercise, could only issue the authorisation if he had a reasonable belief, not suspicion, but belief in the existence of various prescribed matters relating to public safety. Um, so I say again, acceptance of a risk of terrorism and a risk that terrorist planning will succeed is the price we need to pay for the freedoms we demand and rightly demand as residents of a liberal democracy. And it is the price we pay when we travel on public transport, it's the price we pay when we walk through a busy square or down a busy street in London. Before I finish, let me just make one further point about the laws we presently have. Um, Ian has already made the case for better and more coherent laws on communication interception and the, re the retention of communications data. Let me underline that. Um, David Anderson, uh, the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, and again, not a well-known monster, said this in his June 2015 report. RIPA, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, obscure since its inception, has been patched up so many times as to make it incomprehensible to all but a tiny band of initiates. A multitude of alternative powers, some of them without statutory safeguards, confuse the picture further. This state of affairs is undemocratic, unnecessary, and in the long run, intolerable. The opportunity now exists, he said, to take a system characterized by confusion, suspicion, and incessant legal challenge, and transform it into a world-class framework for the regulation of strong and vital powers. You've got to wrap it up. Okay. So, so far as I can see, a system of law that is incomprehensible is unlikely to produce robust and sensible results. The notion that an incomprehensible law is one that can keep us safe is demonstrably false. Um, I think that this all goes to show that um, the way in which our laws um, presently provide for the interception of communications data is something, on the one hand, that's recognised by all to be critical in terms of the ability of our liberal democracy to protect itself. But on the other hand, there is a recognition that those laws are just not good enough. So do our laws keep London safe from terror? No, ladies and gentlemen, they do not. And no, even if we repair the parts of them that are now dysfunctional, they could not be expected to. And the reason is because we val the, sorry, the reason we value these laws all the same is because they are not watertight. And so I urge you that the only response to the motion that we're debating is no. Right. Thank you very much uh, to all our debaters. Uh, so lots of food for thought there. Um, we've got a, a few minutes to...
challenge uh, our speakers on, on their thoughts, and I'd urge you to do that. And I'd give you all the opportunity, actually, to challenge each other for a few minutes as well. A little bit of right to reply as well. Um, let's have some questions um, from our audience to start with. Someone's got to have something. Yeah, go ahead, and we'll come to you in a sec. Go ahead. Uh, we've got a microphone at the back, so we can move. Thanks. <clears throat> tell, tell us who you are and where you're from. David Bacon from Thompson Reuters Practical Law. Um, it's really a question to the yes side. Do you think that the uh, regulation of Ethical Powers Act, RIPA, is fit for purpose and doesn't need any modernization at all? No. I, 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 I don't... I mean, look, if, if, the, if the debate is whether all of our laws are perfect and should never, ever be updated and will keep us safe from terror forever, <coughs> then clearly I'm going to lose. And I, and I would hope um, that people look at it in a slightly more comp complex way. Um, but no, I mean, no, none of the civil liberties organizations have taken that view either in, in respect of the, um, the, the Regulation of in Investigatory Powers Act. And they've, what they've said is yes, we want there to be a secure and open and transparent way of intercepting communications, but it needs to be subject to appropriate safeguards. And they're arguing really about the, the detail um, of the incoming legislation. They're not arguing against the detail. And, and, and the, um, the, the parliamentary committee, isn't, the uh, Joint Committee on Human Rights, isn't arguing against the details. So no, I, I, don't, I don't have an issue in that, so in a wider issue. Okay, thank you, Ian. I, I just fundamentally disagree with you, Adam. Uh, the people who are objecting to the Investigatory Powers Bill keep talking about it as a snooper's charter. Uh, they are extremely dismissive of the need for change. I've sat in the House of Lords watching them, listening to them, debating with them, and I'm afraid there is no consensus in the uh, anti-group around the change in legislation for any change in legislation at all. They just want it to go away. And I, I just disagree with you. I, and in fact, it undermines the yes argument. The fact is, this desperately needs changing. And people who just say no, no, no are the equivalent of people just putting their, you know, their hands in front of their face and hiding behind the curtain. Go ahead, Dan. Well, can I just say, I can't account for the House of Lords. Um, but in the debates we've had... Nobody in, can. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But in the debates we've had in the House of Commons, we're clear there needs to be some change, not just quite as far-reaching as is suggested. Yeah, there was a question right here. Go, 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 hold on one sec. There it comes. Oh, I'm, I'm Katie Hewson. I'm from Practical Law as well. And it's sort of linked to the previous question. We've, it seems to be fairly pretty much common ground that Ripper is not the greatest uh, uh, piece of legislation and needs sorting out. Um, but I, we've heard Ian's views on, on the, the replacement, and I was wondering what the rest of the panel thought of the Investigatory Powers Bill. Who wants to kick it off? Perhaps I'll be ready. <coughs> Go on, Adam. I'll start on the last one. Um, I mean, look, look I... I Without going into the, the minutiae of it, I can see, I can see the case. But the, the interesting thing about Ripper is that Ripper came out of, Ripper came into, into operation at the same time as the Human Rights Act. And my understanding of the legis legislative history of Ripper is that prior to Ripper, there were a series of European Court of Human Rights decisions, um, one called Malone and one called Hul Halford, that required the UK state to beef up its protection of privacy. So what had previously been about telephone networks was suddenly becoming about private telephone networks, um, cellular, cellular networks, and increase and, and email as well at, that, at the very beginning of, of the popularity of email. So it's very interesting that it is now being having to be completely revised because the technology's changed. But I think that the, the criticisms of the bill, and particularly the lack of judicial oversight um, in the current incarnation of it have a lot of force. And I think one thing that we've come to, I mean, the, the, um, quite a few of my colleagues are just starting to work on a major inquiry into undercover policing um, and into what went wrong and why the police 
got out of control. And I think um, Diane was, was part of that. One of my clients was spied on as part of their, um, uh, that they were, well, I mean, in, in, in legal proceedings. And things got very out of control for some reason. And I think that a healthy distrust, or healthy distrust of, but also respect for our security service and police have to be built into any legislation which permits them to spy on ordinary people who aren't necessarily suspected of a crime. I would put it that way. Does it? Do you agree with that, the healthy distrust? I think it's rather missing the point. Um, the important point, which is open to debate as to whether the present bill gets it right or not, is the role of judicial oversight, not just in terms of what decisions are put before judges, but also when are they put before judges? Is it before the event or after the event? And also what information judges are allowed to see, and in particular the extent to which they're allowed to see any intelligence information that is the basis of the application for the warrant. I mean, even more importantly, the current iteration of the bill actually replaces the warrant granting power of the Secretary of State mm. by judges. Yeah. I mean, sorry, end of. Well, I mean, as somebody, I don't know, possibly the only person in the room that's been under surveillance by the security services. And I might add, for at no point was I committing a crime, contemplating a crime, wanting to work with the foreign power. I was just an activist supporting the Stephen Lawrence campaign at the time. I think we have to be very, very careful about the safeguards. And we have to be very, very careful about having genuine judicial oversight as opposed to judicial rubber stamping. Uh, yeah, let's have a question there, then we'll come to you. Yeah, go ahead. Where's that mic? Have we got one here? Yeah, go ahead. That is precisely the point about having revised legislation. The, 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 the difficulty for, the, for Apple, as they put it, is this opens us up completely under a 1789 Act. Well, that's obviously mad. I mean, that must have been ar arranged to deal with problems over quill pens. Um, we're not in that position. But the fact is, we cannot have a place in which a dead terrorist telephone can't be opened by people who can open it uh, when it might tell us who it was that was grooming him to, to do this. I mean, this is, this is fundamental, and it needs legislation. It needs proper legislation. It doesn't... I, I completely understand that one phone is a really bad argument and a bad act. But that means you need good acts and you need good legislation. Mm -hmm. Let me just say this, sorry, about yeah, opening up people's phones. In, I've been in Parliament for 28 years. And what you find is politicians, and I am one, will argue for breaching your civil liberties because it's all about terrorism. And then the next year and the year after that, they're breaching all of our civil liberties. Um, I just think you have to be so careful of a creeping incursion on our civil liberties. That's what I would say, because I've seen what politicians can do. And I would also say this, we cannot always assume a benevolent state, either here or in any other Western country. Can you imagine, I don't want to frighten everybody, that Donald Trump becomes President of the United States and he has powers to breach people's civil liberties. Any feminist, any Mexican, any doctor, reproductive health doctor would have to be very frightened indeed. I think we need legislation which doesn't necessarily assume a benevolent state, because if you go back down the centuries, the state has not always been benevolent. Okay, yes, very quickly, Adam. Oh, sorry, can I? I think, I think yeah. you slightly misrepresented the issue there. The first point is there is a court order in place for 
Apple must unlock the phone. So whether the laws are the problem, I don't think they are. Apple is refusing to comply with the court order. So either they appeal or they're in contempt. So the law is, is doing its job in that sense. It wouldn't do any different here. And the second point is that the, law, the, the court order doesn't say Apple need to unlock the phone. The court order says they must allow the FBI the opportunity to provide unlimited passwords. At the moment, if you try and put in more than 10 wrong passwords, it, locks, it, it blocks the phone forever. What they wanted is give the FBI the, the ability to do that in the general sense. And that's what's being asked for. That is a very major issue, and not just about one terrorist mm -hmm. phone. OK, thanks, Adam. John, um, two points. Firstly, just on, on that one, I think the point that Adam makes is right. Um, what that highlights is the difficulties you can have when you have somebody in the private sector here, Apple, who actually has more information, has a greater ability to decide whether certain information is to be made available to uh, police or other law enforcement agencies than, say, the courts or, say, the government itself. Um, you know, going back to perhaps <coughs> slightly after the days of quill pens, if the you know, government wanted to look inside a letter, there was always somebody with a kettle who could open it. Um, now, iPhones aren't the same, not even if you drop them in water. But it does, it, you know, it raises the point, as Adam said, that what's being asked for is not just that Apple open that phone, but that they give a code to the FBI, yeah. which the FBI could use on other occasions. You asked directly, is there, uh, would the perfect implementation of any law make us safe? No, not any law that we are prepared to accept. And that was the very point that Adam made in opening this, article, this evening. All right, um, I'm wary of the time, so I'm going to take two very quick questions. Yeah, right there, and um, those two. So three questions, very quick. My name is Martin Woods. I'm the head of financial crime for the regulated businesses of um, F and R in Thomson Reuters. Lord Blur, I'm a former police officer. I never worked underneath you. I'm sure it was my loss, not yours. I reference um, some things you said about Mr. Trump. Last year, I presented with Edward Snowden in the Council of Europe, and he informed all of us of how grossly our security services and the American security services breached all of our civil liberties, took away all of our privacy, and actually are not the security services now paying a heavy price for that, and is not our privacy far, and our way we run our lives far more important than the fear of running our lives because of terrorists? And if you, as Diana Abbott says, if you were to give somebody like Donald Trump the powers that you're advocating, what does that mean for actual de democracy? Well, I, I'm, I'm in danger of actually uh, developing my summary right here, but okay. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you the answer straight. Um, we are in a position in which uh, 4.1 million <coughs> Google searches happen every minute worldwide. It is impossible for anybody to imagine how anybody could surveil that. That's just impossible. So what you need is a system that helps the security services or permits the security services to find hay in the haystack. Not a needle in the haystack, but a particular piece of hay in the haystack. And to do that, you need to give them up-to-date powers. Now, the argument which Diane and others are putting forward that if we suddenly turn into a Nazi state, uh, this is a very bad piece of legislation. Don't worry about it, because if we turn into a Nazi state, the legislation surrounding everything else will be appalling. The European Convention of Human Rights is a negative image of Nazi Germany. So in other words, every right that the Nazis took away, the European Convention has granted us. So if we go back to a Nazi state, forget about worrying about surveillance. Okay, thank you, Ian. Re uh, really quick, please, yeah. That one and then that one. Um, go ahead. I couldn't agree more. I absolutely agree with you. And we have to understand that this debate about laws 
is not as important as some of the other issues around community buy-in and communication with individuals. I think what we're talking about now, though, is equipping the security services uh, in a place in which, at the moment, any minute now, it's going to go dark. Everything we've done for 40 years has been around find the phones. Who was talking to whom? That's the crucial development which we're facing. Any minute now, in a year's time, two years' time, that won't exist at all. We will go back to life on Mars as investigators. Okay, final question, then we're going to have closing statements. Go ahead. Yes, Rupert Cooper Coles from Withers Solicitors. Um, a question for the No campaign. Um, would you say empirically... Uh, so um, that's not European Union. Then. No. <laughs> so um, I want to join the other side of that. If that's or, or, or Scottish independence. I'd, I'd, I'd have voted yes on that as well. Yeah, but you're English. That's so, right. Yeah. For, the, for the no side in the debate, um, I mean, you, you, just empirically speaking, um, you mentioned a figure of a, a thousand casualties from um, provisional IRA over... Um, presumably quite a long period. 30 years. 30 years. Um, but in the 11 years since 2005, and with a lot of legislation brought in there, um, and with um, GCHQ apparently legally um, uh, carrying out quite considerable surveillance, um, my recollection on the spot is that the terror attacks we've faced since 2005 in Britain um, have been largely lone wolves. And in terms of coordinated terror attacks in Britain, um, the GCHQ and the security services have been incredibly successful in preventing um, large-scale attacks. Um, and a according to, I can't remember what, what judgment it was, but the GCHQ have been supervised, have, have surveillance has been ruled legal recently. So just empirically speaking, comparing your own experience with Northern Ireland, does it not seem that we are being kept relatively safe? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I disagree with you on one thing, which is you are completely wrong on the idea that there haven't been coordinated attacks. We've got 2005, we've got the airliners plot, we've got a whole series of plots that have been, uh, have been intercepted. But the interception is being done on analog technology. We are moving to digital technology, and unless we change the law, it will go dark. And I'm just gonna make that point as simply as that. What we were doing when we suddenly <coughs> dived on a whole bunch of people in High Wycombe who were going to blow up American planes across, uh, across the Atlantic, which is what has left everybody unable to take liquids onto planes ever since, was done by listening and contact and seeing the contacts of the telephones. That is going to stop. So you better change it. So the current laws do not protect us. Can I also just say, yep. I, I, I do wonder, I don't know the answer to this, but I do wonder whether you're actually comparing like with like, in that Irish terrorism obviously had a particular United Kingdom focus. Um, I think when you're dealing with an international or an internationalist, uh, type of type of uh, situation such as that posed by Islamic extremism, um, the fact that something may happen in the UK that itself obviously involves activity within the UK and casualties in the UK. But there'll be many more people who may be acting or planning in the UK or supporting those who are acting outside the UK. And so, you know, if you want to make a numbers game of it, if that's the right thing, I think you need to compare like with like. Right. Um the rest of the thoughts can go into closing statements. I'm going to be pretty uh, disciplined with this. Uh, one to one and a half minutes. I know I said one and a half to two. Uh, stay in your seats to do these. Um, Adam, go ahead. This, this, the question in this debate isn't, should we update our interception laws? The question in this debate is, do our laws, have our laws kept us safe from terror? Or do our laws keep us... Do our laws keep London safe from terror? And it's not, do our current laws keep London safe from terror? I do ask you to look at this in a slightly more complex way. I just want to highlight a central fallacy, and it, came, and it was clearest in what Jonathan said in the no argument. And it's that there is, that our liberal values create a space for terrorism. That is demonstrably wrong, because illiberal societies are not safe societies. 
They are not safe because terrorists still attack illiberal societies as much as liberal societies. The state itself becomes a terrorist and terrorizes its citizens. So it's a, an, a complete fallacy to imagine, to say that liberal societies are somehow vulnerable or more vulnerable to terrorism. So I say, think of this in a more complex way. Consider the question about laws as a question about liberal laws in a liberal, in a liberal democracy and support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ian. I want to introduce you to a splendid little book uh, called Making Sense of Suicide Missions by a man called Diego Gambetta, who is not, in fact, a manufacturer of mopeds, but is uh, a professor at Oxford University. And he traces the history of suicide missions. And um, there's one particular um, uh, graph that I want you to imagine. And it's a graph about the number of people killed in every attack. And there's a complete, if you think of the left-hand side, little bottom bit, there's a complete load of little dots which are almost completely connected. That's everybody else except the Tamil Tigers who had lots of people killed in different missions. And then he writes underneath it, if I'd had to put Al-Qaeda on this table, I wouldn't have been, there'd have been nothing to show because Al-Qaeda's efforts to kill more people than, and they're obviously the forerunners of ISIS, that this is the situation that's changed. Um, uh, Adam quoted Benjamin Franklin, a great man, but what about Abraham Lincoln? The settled quiet of the past is over. As our case is new, so should we should think anew and act anew. What is required in terms of the change in the law is not draconian. It's enabling, it's enabling the security services and the police to actually get the information they need in order to protect us. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, Diane. I have heard every prophecy of the apocalypse if MPs don't vote for one more incursion of civil liberties that it is possible to hear. We were told that if we didn't pass 90 days detention without trial, you know, the world would end. We didn't pass it. And it wasn't just Labour MPs, it was Tories and Lib Dems. We said no, and the world did not end. <laughs> On 40 days detention without trial, Gordon Brown, who was then Prime Minister and hadn't spoken to me for 15 years, rang me up to prophesy the apocalypse if I didn't vote for 40 days detention without trial. I didn't, and the world didn't end. If we are serious about keeping ourselves safe from terrorism, we have to look at the political context. I heard one of the, um, on the other side saying something about random stop and search of black boys and Muslims and this might help. Help what? Anyone that thinks that more random stop and search of black young men and Muslim young men will make us safe has not spoken to any black or Muslim young men recently. If we want to keep ourselves safe, we have to understand the, the, the general social context. We need to work for peace in some of the regions of the world which are generating this jihadism. And we have to remember why we are fighting terrorism, why we think we are better than some of the regimes that support terrorism. It is about civil liberties. It is about the rule of law. And I repeat what I said in my opening remarks. The laws we have keep us as safe as laws can. Further incursions into people's civil liberties will be counterproductive. Thank you very much, Dan. And finally, uh, Jonathan Swift. Um, think about the motion. The motion is not about safeguards in the law. The motion is about whether the laws keep us safe. Um, just a point of clarification. Uh, it wasn't me that was making the point about the effect on um, people, young men from black and minority ethnic communities of knife crime. That was Baroness Hale, uh, not a well-known uh, right-wing totalitarian. Um, the Yes campaign on this platform, I'll call them the Yes campaign now, um, except that laws um, cannot be expected to give us safety. Uh, they shouldn't be ashamed to accept that. If the debate today was whether the balance has been properly struck between liberty and security, 
Well, of course, there would be legitimate, more than legitimate room for argument. But that is not what this debate is. It is not, despite Adam's suggestion, a complex issue. And I say in brackets, always be very careful when a lawyer tells you that something is a complex issue. I'll say no more. Um, I ask you to focus on the motion. I ask you to focus on the values that underlie, under, uh, underline and underpin the laws that we have. And they are laws about a fair balance. And whenever you strike a balance in general terms, you run the risk that in a particular case, it won't be the right balance. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not a criticism of the laws, but it does mean in terms of this motion, the only answer that can possibly and plausibly be given is no. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jonathan, and to all our uh, debaters. I am genuinely, genuinely intrigued to see which way this one goes. Get, get your voting tools out uh, and cast your, your final vote based on what you've heard. While you're doing that, let me just remind you of where we were before. Yeses were 37, uh, noes were 29, undecideds were 33. Um, just, and while, while you're doing that, um, I, I mentioned this is the first in the second series of our, our legal debate series. Um, we have three more to come this year, including striking doctors, uh, including the environment. So do uh, keep an eye out uh, in your uh, inboxes for notifications uh, of those debates. Um, let's take a look at the result. I assume you've all done it now. If you haven't, uh, we will wait a little bit longer. The no's are so long I've got to actually get up from my seat to see. Yeses uh, have dropped from 37 to 25. No's have risen uh, from 29 to 62 and the undecideds have dropped. It's moving a little bit now but I can safely say uh, everyone here that this motion has been well and truly defeated. Thank you very much indeed.